text sitting on this side here. Um, and I can basically apply a filter to it. I'm going to twist it around so I can see what color I'm applying. Let's just add one like um, saturate. And I've added saturate to the image. And I don't know, just down the bottom, it's just a WebKit filter saturate 100%. And I can adjust, you know, how much. Oops, sorry. No, I can't. <laughs> um, adjust how much saturation is on. It's just CSS applied to any HTML, whether it's video, a div, um, text, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just um, applying that effect to it. But also, if I go inside here on, a, on um, Chrome Canary, you'll see that I can also obviously do, so that's on iOS, doing that one, iPhone, iPad. Um, oh, please, internet, come on. Maybe, I don't know, okay. Um, so here I'm going to come in and we'll do, add, um, I could also do, to the same HTML here, I could do something like, God forbid, and I'm not suggesting you go home and do this either, um, apply curtains. And this is CSS. This is just a filter. All it's doing is bending the pixels on the page. Um, the text is still text. It's still selectable text. There's nothing changed about that. Um, you know, you can change the, you know, the number of folds, you know, the fold size, the amount, you know, open show. I mean, I'm not suggest please don't go home and put curtains on a web page or suggest that we're suggesting that's the future of the web. That's just a, a sort of a fairly silly example. Um, maybe something like, you know, spherize and um, you know, I can sort of spin content around like this um, on a page. You'll notice that down here, this again is just a WebKit filter. Um, so it's just applying different amounts on there. The cool thing about it is that I can also, because it's a WebKit filter, I can animate it from you know zero percent, one hundred percent, or put put stops in between, um, and then you know sort of play it and have my content. And again, it's just HTML selectable. Everything still on there is still HTML, etc. What might that look like? Here I've done just an example with a map. This has just got layers and just spinning. This is just a globe running. And that's just layers of flat um, stuff. I'm literally using things like um, CSS uh, shadows on the globe as well and stuff like that. So that, that gives you a bit of an idea. So that's that's like filter lab. That's the, the shaders that I was talking about, the CSS shaders. But hopefully, I'm going to jump into code pen. These currently are working in, in test versions of a bunch of different browsers. Things like Mozilla um, is putting it in Firefox, um, Safari, you see. Um, and this is um, Chrome Canary. Um, it's in the, the experimental builds at the moment. If we can get there. Grind the internet on a bit. So I'll wait till that comes up. So these these are things we're not charging for. This is not like stuff we're selling to people to build stuff. This is just um, working with the browser companies, um, with the W3C, uh, with WebKit, etc. Um, and like looking at moving the web forward. What's the future of the web going to look like? What sorts of things you can do? We're not suggesting that you go out and you start spherizing all your web pages and curtains open up every page at all. But there are there are times, and um, if this would, would open up, I could show you some really good examples on here. Some of the things like the blending, the regions, etc. You've got you've got it up and running down there. Awesome. I don't have it up and running here. <laughs> I don't know why my connection is. Um, oh, is good. Oh, yeah. But if you um, it's sort of going to be a bit hard to hold your laptop up, but hey, this is um, CodePen by Adobe. A um, whole bunch of stuff there. If you open it up in Chrome Canary, you'll see the blend modes um, running. Some pretty cool stuff. You'll see the regions um, and some of the shaders and stuff happening as well. And I have no idea what's going on with the uh, internet. So I'm going to give up on, on that part. OK, cool. So let's. That's sort of some of the stuff. Um, where to find more about that at html.adobe.com. We've got a whole section of the um, site there which is just about the future of the web. Stuff that we're doing that's um, web standards based, that we're giving back to W3C, giving back to the, to the browsers. Okay. 
everything we do obviously isn't just about giving back free stuff. So we've obviously built a whole bunch of new tools. Um, and some of that stuff I wanted to show you tonight, some of the, some of the things that we've been doing for um, HTML5 um, CSS3 development. But we've built tools in the last couple of years that we've released as this family called the Edge Tools and Services. So it's a whole bunch of different applications all under the family name of Edge. Um, and they're both aimed at both designers and developers. So some are developers, some are designers, some are a bit of a mix in between. So I'm guessing you guys are all developers? Fair enough to say? Anyone, come on, someone own up to being a designer, no? Not one. They're horrible, those designers. <laughs> um, I just want to show you something that, um, how many of you, how many of you when you're de designing a website or developing a website, have a designer come to you with a thumb drive, you know, they come into your office and they go, hey, I've got the new design for the website. And you go, oh, awesome, what, what is it? And they go, it's a Photoshop file. And you go, well, what am I going to do with a Photoshop file? I've got to write CSS and HTML. There's nothing in Photoshop that will help me do that at all. So often what we do is we print out the Photoshop file, we sit it next to us, and we start writing HTML, CSS, and we try and match it as best we can. The designer comes back, looks at it, and hates what we've done. We hate them because they've given us a Photoshop file, and there's this, this serious hate-hate relationship between designers and developers. So I'm going to show you something that's not part of the Edge Tools first. I'm just going to jump into um, Photoshop. Uh, just open up a file here. So this is a new new version of um, Photoshop that we're launching next um, oh, a couple of weeks from now. Um, and I'm also going to open up at the same time, I'm going to open up one of the Edge tools, this uh, program called Edge Code. And I'll just, um, just open up the folder. And All right, jump back into Photoshop so we can see what we're doing. So here is a design. This is typically something a, a, a designer, web designer might give you. Um, I've got a little bit of text, some menus, some you know, transparent overlay. I've got this big word Maui sitting on here, all this other content. Sitting inside Photoshop, we give it to you, start to build a page from. Um, in the past, nothing that you would do, you just start from scratch. We didn't have anything in Photoshop that would help you. So now I'll just show you that I'm not sort of cheating. Across here in code, this is the HTML for the page. So I'm not trying to cheat. Yes, I've got all the HTML here first. And I've obviously got all of these classes are all named according to the Photoshop file. So I'm not trying to cheat. But I'll show you, I'll talk about code a little bit later. But the preview, when you use Edge Code, the preview for it is um, is Chrome. So here's Chrome and it's previewing the page that's sitting inside each code. Every time I make a change, it updates inside, um, inside Chrome. So I'm actually using Chrome as the live preview for it. So if I go back into Photoshop, you'll see, you know, you'll see in there there's like obviously no, there's just the text, there's no design um, in there. Okay, if I go back to Photoshop, what I'm going to do is just come down to the layers and what we've added now in this new version of uh, Photoshop is the ability now from a layer just to go copy CSS from that layer. So I've just selected the, this top layer, which is this whole section at the top here. I'm just going to copy the CSS from that. And yes, in my HTML, I've got the right class names and the divs, and I'm using the right names. Where did I get those from in here? It's just using the layer names to give me that CSS. So yes, the designer and the developer needs to work together. But if I come back into the styles now, I can just paste that in there, save it, and there it is in my in my browser with that top section um, done with the layer, this, you know, the layer and stuff down here. Um, that's uh, that's something that new that we've added. Is it a hundred percent done? Am I ready to stick that up on the web? No. It's it's that 80-20 percent rule. It gets me a hell of a long way there. And then I'm going to start to look at responsive design. I'm going to start looking at you know a little bit more of the structure. But at least now, what I get from a designer, 
I don't have to just start from scratch and build my HTML and CSS from exactly the same, um, well, not exactly the same, actually, slightly different from um, Illustrator. I'm just going to close that and open up another folder inside code. Oops, not the longest try to find. Okay, so this is typically, again, typically a design that you would get for a web page from a graphic designer. Um, sort of, you know, menu, different icons, buttons, different sections on the on the page. Um, so if I again I've done I've got the HTML out here. If I open up the uh, main page and open it up, you'll see that here I've got some text sitting on the page, sitting inside there. But I can go to the Illustrator file and so for example, just grab this top grey bar. You'll notice that when I do that, because in my layers, if I zoom down in here and Zoom in a bit so you can see what I'm doing. You notice that my layer is called head PG. Illustrator has automatically given me the class CSS for oh, head PG. So all I need to do is just come in here and copy that style, come across, and yes, I'm pasting in the head of my document. It's a demo. It's, I should obviously put it in the style sheet. But I'm just going to paste it in there, and whoops, I'm going to paste it in there, and. Why isn't that updating? Oh, there we go, okay. Um, I have the head in there. If I jump back to the Illustrator file, obviously when I'm working in Illustrator here, you'll notice that all the text, I've used um, styles, character styles inside Illustrator. When I do that, inside this CSS properties panel inside Illustrator, it gives me all of the styles. As soon as I create a paragraph style or a character style, it automatically puts them in here. So I can select that one, select all the way, shift select all of those, copy all of those um, styles, come back over to Edgecode, let's just paste those in there, save it, and now my text has got all of those character styles and paragraph styles that came from Illustrator. And then if I go back to Illustrator, let's just copy absolutely everything. Let's just go command A, get everything. And this time I'm actually, rather than copying the styles and pasting them across, I'm actually going to, first of all, generate the styles for all of that content and now I'm going to export it as a CSS file. Let's just call it my CSS file and save it in that folder. But here's what's cool about it. Notice what's in the folder at the moment. There's nothing in there but the HTML, this base CSS file, the Illustrator file. If I click Save in there, I can then get some options about do I want it to work across all the different browser prefixes, et cetera, for this to work, et cetera, et cetera. And if I click OK, what it's done, if I jump out of here, once it's done it, Jump out of here. I'll find that folder on the desktop. And you'll notice that it's actually exported from Illustrator all of my image files, um, including there's my CSS file that's created. But it's actually output all of those image files that I'm going to need for the web um, across um, in there. If I then come into my page here, I'm just going to add that as a link at the top, let's just copy that one, paste it in, change the base to my, and save it. And here we are on my page. Here's all the content on the page come across from Illustrator. It's nice. I zoom down a bit. We're already starting to be percentage-based, responsive design in there. Sort of cool. Still work to do. It's not 100% of the way there. It's like 80%, you still need to do a lot of cleaning up on it. But you'll notice that there's one thing that's not here, the word um, outdoor that was on the Illustrator file over here. So what I'm going to do is go back to Illustrator, and I'm just going, you'll notice that in the Illustrator file, it's actually text that's been converted to outlines. So it's now vector. So what I'm going to do is just copy it, come back to my HTML, and I'm just going to paste that directly into my HTML page. And I've got a spot here all identified for it. Just, just paste it there and save it. And there it is. It's an SVG file. Because I've copied from Illustrator, 
it just copies it as SVG. I just paste it in my HTML as SVG. Right in there. Don't have to do anything else. With it. Um, so that's sort of sort of pretty cool. It means now that I can work with a designer and a developer can work together doing some um, some sort of cool stuff. Um, because it's pretty, sort of pretty cool. Okay. Um, I'll come back to Edge Code. I might talk um, a little bit. Uh, so we came up with a whole bunch of Edge tools and services. So you saw a little bit of Edge Code there. And I'll, I'll talk about Edge Code really quickly. The purpose behind Edge Code is we wanted to build, that's a great example with, um, with all of that um, SVG file in it now, but anyway, and, and CSS in the head, but anyway. Um, what we wanted to do was build a super, super, super light editor for code and just for web, for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, nothing else. Just a web um, code um, developer tool. Wanted it to be super lightweight. We built it totally in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The entire application is built in that. And in fact, it's built on top of brackets. So brackets down here, if I open up brackets, um, this is brackets, and brackets is an open source editor. It's actually an open source project that we're running. There's a new release, cool. Um, I won't get it now. Um, but it's totally open source. We're running it at Adobe, but in fact, most of brackets has been built by the community. People are adding features to it and uh, working on it. It's up on GitHub. If you want to work on it, contribute it. If you just want to fork it and basically use it as your own editor and, and take it a different direction, build your own code editor, go crazy. If you can build CSS, HTML, and JavaScript, you can do whatever you want with brackets. You can customize it to your own needs. Um, what Edge Code is, so that's brackets. Open source project, go crazy. If you want to contribute, awesome, that's, that would be cool. But this is code, all it is is brackets wrapped up in a nice clean application for people who don't want to hack their editor. Um, so Edge Code, very, very lightweight. Um, it's, I'll, I'll tell you some of the features um, of it. Um, I'm not sure how this will go with this particular file, but let's see, let's see how we go. Um, one of the, um, one of the things is I've just clicked into my code there, my HTML code, and hit Command E or Control E if I'm on a PC. That's what that's doing is it's actually opening up the related CSS, no matter where it is, in the flow of the page for me. So I don't have to go looking for the CSS, jump to the CSS file, make a change, come back to it. It's opening it up in the flow of the page. That doesn't mean it's not inline CSS. I'm not talking about inline CSS. This is in just visually showing it to me in the flow of the page. And in fact, you can see that that particular, you know, there's two different rules in two different um, areas of that that I can jump between. Um, also, I can um, come in here. Oh, and let's let's preview the page. So let's get the page open in the background. This is probably a really bad example because uh, I don't know where there's a paragraph tag in here. Um, yeah, I can't see the text changing, but because I'm changing that text, yeah, I don't know, I don't know where there's um, some in that. But just by clicking on the text here, and I don't know if you can see me do that, just clicking and just dragging the number. Um, it's just all hot text. Every number is hot, a hot number. Um, then, and also the colors, uh, hot colors, if I come in here, I get the color lookup of each of those. Um, if I, whoops, so I'm not doing this very wrong. Jump out here, where have we got a color? Here's a color, open that up, and it's giving me the color um, straight away in, in there, just being able to choose. And as I'm updating that, if, what if, depending on what that is on the page, it's not a good example page to use for this. Oh, okay, I did go to the text. Um, if I go back to the color, I'm not sure what I'm changing on there at the moment. Oh, the links. 
So basically all the inline stuff, you just hit to, if, if you want to go into um, an element set, just hit um, command E, opens up um, all of the CSS inline for you, all of the linked CSS. Um, the preview is, um, is just in Chrome, so you're just seeing the updates as you're making them automatically um, inside Chrome while you're working. Um, obviously it does code completion, code introspection for all the CSS. Um, and uh, JavaScript as well, obviously. So, you know, if I'm in here um, and you know, start diving, it's doing all my code completion for me. The cool thing is, this is extensible because it's built on top of brackets. All the people that are building extensions for brackets, those extensions start working for um, code as well. So, to install um, an extension, I can just open up the extensions manager. You'll see in here that I've already added a couple of extensions to, um, to Edge Code for me. If I want to, um, I can search for the, uh, basically go and search for um, new extensions on the website, on the Edge Code website, um, and just install them directly from GitHub. Um, just get the, the URL, the zip, and it will install those directly into um, Edge Code for me and give me additional um, functionality inside there. Also, if I'm doing fonts inside here, we've added another thing, which is Edge Web Fonts. So if I do um, you know, font family, um, and then and open up Browse Web Fonts. These now, this is another part of the Edge family and one of the services. We, I don't know if you know about Typekit. You know about Typekit? Basically, Typekit is a service that is Adobe we, we acquired a couple of years ago um, where you can subscribe to online fonts and on your website use really cool custom web fonts. Um, and that's a paid for service, a subscription service. Um, Edge web fonts, basically, we got together, you know, Google web fonts. We basically got together with Google, we got all of Google's web fonts, a whole bunch of the Adobe free fonts and I've put them up as Adobe Edge web fonts. These are totally free to use, you don't need to do anything. Just, um, in fact, there's a website, html.adobe.com, you can go in, find the web, um, Edge web fonts, and you can just start using them in your sites tomorrow for free. You just put the, the link, uh, the JavaScript in your head of your file, and then just start using it as font family, whatever the font is. But inside Edge code, you can actually just add those really simply. So if I wanted to search for you know, uh, serif fonts, font serif fonts, um, you know, script fonts, uh, monotype fonts, etc. I can just um, sort of jump through here, pick a font. Once I like it, I just select that, click done, and that's added it. You'll notice that it's added it to my font family. But also now, I can click up here to this, and this is the code. All I need to do is copy that, click done, go to the head of my page, Disgusting page. Sorry, apologies for that. Um, and up in the head of the page, just you know, put my um, script tag for my font. Done. That's all I need to do to use that. There's no subscription. There's no payment for Edge Web Fonts. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. It's all the Google Font Library and um, the Adobe's like heap of Adobe's fonts up there as well. Um, okay, that's Edge Code. The next. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about was um, the issue, I think that probably the biggest issue that's facing um, developers today, designers and developers today, and that's building responsive sites. Um, most websites out there, I think something like it's over 90% of uh, websites out there currently are built for the desktop, are designed for the big browsers. And you open them up on your tablet, you open them up on mobile phones, and it's you know that nightmare of having to like, zoom in on a web page. So we wanted to we wanted to build a tool that made it easy for developers to build a responsive website according to the best practice of building sites. So we built, and this is still not finished. The file, but like 1.0 isn't released yet. It's still in preview. But it's called Edge Reflow. Um, and let me sort of explain to you quickly how it works. It's basically a, a 
hold your hand while you make responsive sites. Um, so what do I mean? So I've got a page here, there's the background of the page, and then it's got one container you want it. In fact, it sort of makes sense if I, if I do this down here. I've got the body, and then one container div. That container div has got these columns sitting inside it. Because when I'm doing proper responsive websites, um, the best way to do responsive websites is actually to use this column structure in the head where you have columns and gaps, and you can change the amount of columns the way things flow between different tabs. So how does it work? If I, I've got two main tabs in here, one for layer and one for styling. It's all just CSS. All this is is CSS between these two. Um, and then um, I've got a few tools here just for adding a div, text, and images. But this is basically how it works. I come in here and I um, draw a div at the top. And already, if I grab this like little tab at the side, this is just resizing my browser, you'll notice already that div is just being responsive by, by default as it sort of drags back and forth. But let's go in and start a little bit. So I'm going to add maybe a little bit of a color to the background to it. I can come in here, I can add some uh, rounded corners to it if I want to, God forbid. Um, but I want to stick an image in there. So if I go on to, let's just check I'm in the right place on the desktop. I have to do some good images here. Okay, so I've got um, an image in there. I've then got the choices of how do I place that image in my page so that it's responsive. Obviously, at the moment, it's just going to um, hide you know, um, part, of the, part of the image. But what I might do is come into that image and say, OK, I want the scaling um, horizontally to cover. And I want the position of it vertically to um, center. So now, when I move my, you'll see I'm starting to get responsive of different sizes or I can choose with the image, maybe I want it to be um, well, if I do cover there that's not going to be a good, a good plan, but uh, maybe I want it to be um, percentage of the page. Yep. So you can see as I do it, it's starting to change the way that it uh, goes across. Do I want it to repeat, no repeat, etc. The best way I would do this for responsive design is the first way of doing it is using color, doing no repeat, and then I've got a page that sort of nice at any different size uh, as it scales down. I'm going to put another box on here now. Let's put on maybe a box down here and snap it in there. I can then grab an image. I want to add it. Um, Add an image to that. I'm going to come down, choose, say, for example, this one. And I want to place that inside that box there. Let's come back to the layout, get rid of the margins. In fact, let's just push that back inside the box. Okay. I can then, as the page is, you'll see, as it's starting to change all of these elements as I'm adding them, they're sort of holding your hand to make it responsive. What I'm going to do is jump on to another file where I've actually added more content so you can see the benefit of reflow. Okay, so all I've done here, I've got that top image, I added a logo, I added some text, I added these blocks, and I've done nothing else. It's the same as it was. They're a little bit responsive. They're sort of you know, starting to be. But this starts to fall apart. I get to here, and the columns are a bit narrow. If I go to a mobile, that's just ridiculous. But even here, as a tablet, it's starting to fall apart a bit. So with my content on here, what I'm going to do is just click this big plus button up the top here, click the plus button, and it's giving me this purple bar here 
which is a media query. It's just a media query for that, for that size. Then I can start to move elements around. So I might say, okay, well, for this size, I want to push this one down. So let's actually put that one down underneath. Let's grab this div here, and let's sort of stretch that div across to there. Let's grab this div and maybe snap that in there. Let's pull it out to here. Um, and then obviously this one down here, I'm going to need to bring down a little bit further. Maybe let's bring this one right across the strip loops. Um, I did something wrong there. <laughs> I pushed this one inside the other. Okay. There um, we go. It's better. Um, stretch this one right out across the screen. Um, I can grab this image. Instead of doing the size auto, let's maybe make it percentage and maybe make it I don't know, uh, 38%. And I can grab text. Let's make it text. Like thirty eight percent as well, or forty. Let's not have that um, below. Let's just drag that across. It. You see now I'm just starting to change my content. So there it is for a tablet. Oh, let's grab this box and make that work. There we go. So there it is for a tablet. There it is for my desktop. And I've just done a media query and just done it totally visually moving content around. Then what I do is I come down to here and say, well, when I get to here, it starts to fall apart. Let's add another media query and do this for a mobile. And I can add them as I go down. So I can either decide, do I want to do maximum um, media queries or do minimum media queries as I go up? And I can choose how to do that um, using the tab across there, which I can't at the moment. Um, and as I keep adding them, so I've actually got this finished. Let me close it up here and show you a finished version of it. The idea of reflow is that it holds your hand making the right decisions um, and you're just sort of doing a visual. So you'll see at the top, I've got the default, the tablet, and the mobile. And as I click between those, so I get the tablet layer, the mobile layer. Um, and it's not always, um, you know, you go to, I mean, you, you know this yourself, so you, when you go to a mobile phone, it's not a case of squashing content down. Sometimes it's a case of making stuff bigger on a, on a mobile phone, um, especially if you know, text, etc. cetera. So um, the idea of this is to assist you and hold your hand in making good decisions, making proper um, responsive decisions. This, this would deal with my question, you're moving on entirely. Sorry. Sorry. Does it also deal with removing elements entirely as you go into smaller and smaller that moving headers, for example, as you do a mobile? But in some, in some cases, where the as you shrink the as you narrow the screen, you don't need them to be all the elements; you want all the elements to disappear. Yeah. So you want to hide? You want to take something off? Okay, so on my mobile, yeah, 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 good question. So on my mobile, this particular section here, I don't want um, on my mobile, so I'm just going to get rid of that one. And but is it still there on my tablet? Yes. But it's not there on my mobile. Yeah. Um, and also down the bottom, so you'll notice one of the things down the bottom, or, or on here, you'll notice that while I'm doing this, some of these rules have come up as purple. Why is that? Because my default CSS, my just normal default CSS, is the original stuff that I wrote with all my content and layout. And then as I'm adding and overriding those with media queries, it's showing me what rules I've, over, I've written over. So if I look down the bottom here, just say, for example, I pick one of these boxes, let's pick this box here, and I open that up down the bottom, you'll notice that here is my default CSS for that div, but here is the tablet overridden CSS, and here is the mobile overridden CSS. So it's giving me um, each of those. So this is some, um, there's a few other things that we've, uh, we've um, got in here as well, and I'll, I'll explain this little I one to you a little bit later because that's pretty cool. Um, and also the library in here. So if I've got the library, it's giving me all my images so I can keep um, using and edit and update my content into there. But this is this is not 100% complete yet. It's getting close. We've had it out as a beta for a while for people to play with. And we've been adding adding features on based on feedback from people. But we're getting pretty good feedback from people who are using this to, to start to build responsive 
on pages. So I don't know. I don't know what you guys think. Does this look like something that's worth having a play with? It's good. It's good. Pretty nice. I mean, it really helps you build a very, very nice, responsive um, pages and content on it. Um, this little. This little um, button here, I sort of uh, I mentioned just a moment ago. I might talk about that next. And to do that, I'm going to have to actually just change networks on a couple of these devices because I don't think I need the internet anymore. So I'm just going to go into here. Yeah, okay, that one's going to run on there. And hopefully. Yeah, I'm all running on the same one now, I think. Ooh. Okay. So, one of, the, one of the issues that you sometimes have with, um, with developing websites across devices, a bunch of different devices, you've got a whole bunch of different devices you're testing on. If you're not, you probably should be. Um, and test, you know, we've got the iPhone, iPad, we've got this model, we've got that model, we've got an Android phone, we've got a Microsoft phone, we've got, you know, whatever. Um, the issue in the past with testing across those is that you're working and you, then you upload it to a site. You go into your browser on your tablet, you type in the URL, you hit return, you look at it and go, uh, okay. You have to type it in on your phone, you do it there, you check on another phone, an Android phone, you check on a BlackBerry Windows phone, you try all the different ones. You look at them all and go, you go back and make a change, you upload it, you go back and refresh, refresh, refresh. Yeah. So this, this little utility um, called Inspect is basically designed to help you work through that problem. So this is Edge Inspect. When you open it up, it just gives you this little menu at the top. It's nothing else, um, literally, when you launch it, it just pops, pops that open. So you do that, it opens that. Awesome. But what it also gives you is inside Chrome. Um, inside Chrome, up here, and I'm not connected to that anymore. Anyway, we'll work through that. Um, you'll notice that I've also now got this little edge inspector icon up here. And if I do that, it's waiting for a connection. So on my, hopefully, if this all works, what I'm going to do is my iPhone up on the screen so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to go to an application called Edge Inspect on my iPhone, on Android, all the different phones as well, devices, etc. I'm going to launch Edge Inspect. As I do that on my iPhone, let's pull this back across so you can see what's happening inside here. Here it is. It's seen my iPhone um, on here. And oh, an error because so I'm not I'm not on the page. Let me and I'm not on the web, so I'm going to need to pretend to run a page. Let me open up something inside here. What have I got? This is good. Please. Oh, come on, you can do it. The issue is on the wireless in here, it won't let me talk between the three devices in it. It doesn't recognize them on the same wireless in the guest network. Um, so I'm running a little wireless here that's not. Is that going to refresh now? Very slowly. I'm not sure why it's doing it so slowly. Mm. Okay, I think because I'm not, I'm not um, connected to the net, it's not going to run in there. So let me give me two seconds. Let's see if we can get this one in. I've got nothing in H2 box. Let's quickly draw the website. The world's fastest built website.
Please. Thank you very much. Nice. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. 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 Oh, sorry about this. Oh, as you can see on my phone, it's running this way. But I don't want to turn this way. Oh, okay, there we go. Ah, oh, right. awesome. And on my phone, please do it. Please. Why is that taking so long? Okay. I have no idea what's happening on the moment. So the idea though is that you basically run inspect on all the different devices and not the switch up. It's always a nightmare doing it in a closed um, environment we don't have to um, and, oh, yeah, I don't know why it would take that long to open up local host, but that should be on my phone, and if I open it up on my tablet, it should open up. The cool thing is, you see it not as that, but you see it as the mobile version. So whatever the responsive design is, it will see on there. If it was working, yeah. oh. <laughs> I have mean, no idea why it's that slow, sorry. Um, if I open it up on here, run inspect on my on my iPad as well. The pressure thing is that doesn't take ten minutes to load. But you'll see it's now seeing both my iPad and my iPhone. It would have Android phones, whatever whatever the other ones you have on there. And as I I'm I'm not going to click on another page because it might take five minutes. But as you click on it, normally what happens is it's super responsive. If you click on a link on your desktop, all the other devices go follow that link. They'll follow the page, they'll go to where you're navigating to. But the cool thing is, you can see on the page what the mobile version is looks like um, on the page, assuming that that comes up at some stage on there. Um, but the cool thing is that I can then do is my client wants to know, oh, what's my website look across all these different devices? And obviously also on there, you know, if you go in um, landscape versus portrait view, you'll get that view as well. But my client wants to know what that looks like. I'm going to make it run full screen on there, so I'm just clicking on the browser on my desktop, so I run that up on full screen on the phone. And then I can, across all of those different devices at the same time, I can take a snapshot. Ka-ching. That's just taken it on my phone, taken it on my iPad, and if I now open up the folder, there's the image that it just took um, off, the, off the phone with the page that's there. Um, also, the next thing, and I'm starting to be quite nervous about whether it's going to do this or not, you'll notice that next to each of these there's a little bracket um, sitting next to here. So I'll try it on the iPhone. I'm going to open up now Remote Inspection. I've no idea why this is so slow and that's what I'm doing. But anyway, I don't know if this will work, but what should work in here, it actually opens up Winery. I don't know if you know Winery. W-E-I-N-R-E. -E. It's a remote inspection tool that works in Chrome. Um, and what it will enable me to do is actually to go in on my desktop and remotely inspect the content, the HTML and the CSS on, on the device and make changes to it and see on my desktop and see it live on the phone as I'm working. And it's not going to run, so I'm not going to put it up. Okay. Um, but that's the other benefit, and that's probably one of the strongest benefits of it is this remote inspection ability. Because what I can actually start to do is go through, you know when you use like Firebug, and you go through with Firebug and do inspect on the page, and you can edit, you do that on remote devices from your desktop. Oh, <laughs> Guess what? That iPad just came up. Um, I don't, it shouldn't be that slow. I don't know why. But anyway, all good. Okay. Um, that's inspect. Sort of pretty awesome. But the cool thing about it is that I was showing you a moment ago in Reflow. Basically, here is the edge inspect button inside Reflow. So when I launch that and I connect up to one of these, 
what it's going to show me now, hopefully, hopefully, let's turn it on. Maybe. The point here is that you don't have to push it out to the website, you do it on the Just do it directly. And so the things, the devices do need to be on the same local network. Um, I mean, yeah, they need to be able to see each other on the same. But the one here, we, we have the same issue at Adobe at, at our, our office. The local guest network is so locked down, it's seriously tight. And I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's the case here. I tried to get them talking before and they would be the um, But you get the idea. I can turn on um, inspect inside here and start to, um, I'm just going to update over this. I have no idea why this is so slow. Okay, I'll jump out of here. So, so far I've shown you very briefly, I've shown you um, each code, really small, fast, lightweight code editor. Um, it's also not 1.0 yet. It's still in beta. Um, but it's public preview, you can have to play with it. Um, and um, see what you think. Don't throw away your normal code editor yet, please. Um, it's still, we're still working on, we're still adding a whole bunch of stuff to it. But um, people are starting to like it, I think, which is cool. The next one I want to show you is probably the, the one that gets the most use, I would think, out of the Edge tools, is Edge Animate. And this is, um, this is basically a tool that a lot of people said when we, we removed our focus from Flash and we moved our focus to HTML, people were going, oh, what about Flash? What about websites that, you know, exciting things spin and fly and explode everywhere? What about those sites? Well, I mean, we're not suggesting that you should be doing those. Oh, there's my, <laughs> everything's about two minutes behind. Um, there's my reflow document um, showing on the tablet. But it's the wrong way out. Sorry? Isn't that the wrong way out? Yeah, but because I didn't do it at the right okay. sizes. Okay. So it's actually saying this is wide enough. The resolution on here is wide enough for, I think I did my tablet one at 700. And this is, that's wider than 700. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's not, it's not showing you. I don't know if my phone's going to show up. Um, so each, each animate is a tool that enables you to um, do animation in HTML. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, but it also enables you to do interaction and, inter and animation in HTML. So you can actually create some, some pretty cool stuff um, inside it. And probably the sorts of things that you used to use um, Flash for, um, in the past, a lot of that sort of banner interactive, you know where you wanted one section of your page just to have some sort of really engaging, dynamic, interactive part. Um, that's sort of what this is good for now. Let me, let me show you, um, it's, one of the best parts of it is on the front of it are all of these um, in-app lessons, tutorials, and they're actually, they're not videos, they're actually projects that you open up inside Animate, you step through, walk through, and it, um, it tells you what you're doing. But um, I'm going to just create um, a new file and walk you through this really quickly. So um, if you've used something in the past like um, Flash or After Effects, this is very, very similar. Um, first of all, the Properties panel, whoops, got a bit crazy there, the Properties panel, this has got all of the properties um, of whatever I'm currently working on. Whatever I have selected, that'll give me the properties for. Obviously, at the moment, it's the document that I'm working on, um, the file, and I'll explain that in a moment. Then I've got the stage. This is the white area here. This is where all the fun stuff happens. This is what I'm going to take and put inside my HTML page. Okay, So I can just take this, and, and I'm going to put this somewhere on the, on the page. Um, then I've got the elements panel. And I'll come back to this, although you guys have realized already this has got like a div. So you're pretty clear that, okay, the stage on my web page is going to be a div and there's going to be stuff that's happening inside that. Um, the library is where I can keep, um, similar to Flash, where I can keep symbols that I can use over and over and over again. Um, and then down the bottom is the timeline. Let me build something really quickly. There's four tools 
inside here. Square, rounded rectangle, ellipse tool, and text tool. Um, if I grab one of these and just draw a shape on there, let's come in and uh, grab the corners, and let's increase the size of the corners. We actually cheated you. How many tools are there? We seriously cheated you. How many tools are there? Two, yeah. <laughs> Because all these three are just divs with different levels of rounded corners. So, so this is a div that I've done here. Let's come in and um, you know change the background color up here. Oh, that's awesome! Seriously, this is going to be the best. Yes, this is. I'm going to put this on my website later. Um, so I've created um, div. Oh, I could put also. I could put on the edits because I can. Let's um, put a shadow on it. Um, and I'm just going to leave it like that because that looks awesome. Um, I've just all I've done is created div background color, um, border radius, um, drop shadow, um, you know, box shadow, etc. But I want to animate it. So all I'm going to do is normally when you animate something, you, you think about an animation of something going like this. You know, it moves around. But all you're doing when you do that is is changing two properties, x and y. Maybe you're doing rotation as well, so maybe when you scan it. But because this is CSS, I can animate any CSS property over time. God forbid. I could animate the border thickness, color, you know, the rotation, the skew, the opacity. I can animate them all over time. Anything that you want to. In this particular case, I'm not going to. I'm actually just going to, first of all, Come in here and add a keyframe for X and Y position. So I'm just going to choose X and Y position, whoop, and Y position. And you'll notice that it's now added those on my rounded rectangle div. In the timeline, it's added these two keyframes. All I need to do now is just drag along the timeline and just move that object down the screen. And then when I play it, it's now animating those two properties between those two values. If I hit Command Enter or Control Enter, it's now happening. Oh, awesome! Now it decides to work. Um, it's <laughs> um, so down in here. That's now HTML5. It's going to run obviously on my iPad. Yes. Um, I think it's doing that just to tease me, but it wouldn't work before. So. Um, that's that's the most basic way of animating you can possibly imagine. Just grabbed an object and changed its X and Y value. That's really simple. But I'm going to jump out of animation for a moment. I'm going to show you something different. Let's close that one down. Let's not save it, even though I sort of love the color scheme. But um, let me jump out of here. And hopefully somewhere. I have just an HTML page. Let me do a little search for a moment. Uh, yeah, I think somewhere down inside here. Sorry, I should have. Um, oh, I have just an HTML file. So this this page here, this is just um, an HTML page. Um, it's got some heavy assets, it's got some CSS fonts and images. Just to prove it to you, so you know I'm not cheating, let's just open it up in a browser. Oh, come on, why, is, why are my pages taking so long to run? There's something seriously weird with Chrome, I think, tonight. Okay, I don't know why it's doing that, but that's a little weird. It's a normal web page. Um, I'm going to jump back into. Oh, okay, thanks. So here it is, just normal page. Text, images, nothing, nothing exciting, bit of stuff in there. But I'm going to grab that page and I'm going to drop that page on Edge Animate. So this is different to what I did before. What I did before was I was going to take a little bit and put it inside a page. This time I'm taking a whole page and putting it inside Edge Animate. This is HTML already written, and hopefully, if it does it a little bit more quickly, please, something seriously weird with my machine. Oh, 
Oh, wow, okay. Um, up in here, you'll see that it's gone through that page and it's identified all of the HTML in that page. So I've, here I've got everything inside that page. So now I could do things like I've got some text here. Let's just zoom in a little. So I've got, I've got three bits of text down here. I'm just going to shift select each of these. And what I'm going to do is maybe put a keyframe on these for opacity. I'm going to turn them to um, zero opacity. Let's do them like two seconds. And then I'm going to add another keyframe and make them. So now when my page runs, the text fades in. You've got to do the sound effect yourself, but it's pretty cool. So that's going to run like that now. I mean, but you shouldn't stop there, seriously. You should, uh, on a page, if you've got something like this image at the top here, well, we could do something like, I don't know, let's, um, let's add a keyframe for rotation. Let's add a keyframe for uh, transform scale. Should we do scale? Yeah, let's do that, because we can. Uh, let's set it at the beginning to zero, uh, zero. And let's set the opacity of oh, no, rotation. Oh, that'll do. And let's come up. Let's add more keyframes for each of these. So we'll let the scale to 100. Uh, set the scale Y to 100. And set the rotation to, I don't know, what, 360. And so now it's going to. And then, because that's sort of, I mean, that's sort of okay, but it's not that exciting. Why don't we grab the rotation and then select this little button here called easing? And if we choose the easing for that, we can do, um, we can do ease in, quad, cubic, port, ease out, ease in out, swing, etc. I'm going to do like ease out and maybe something like, I don't know, bounce would be pretty cool. And then if I run this, uh, run that, and then I'm going to run it in my web page to see what it looks like. Every single web page in the entire world should have a banner image that looks Oh, come on. It's got to be quicker than that. Um, there's something seriously wrong with this. But obviously it's going to spin on when it comes on five minutes from now. Um, that means that you're all waiting. <laughs> waiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know why. Sorry. But basically, I don't have to create something and put it in a web page for a I can take an entire HTML page and animate elements of that page. You're now going, oh my god, you've just written this disgusting animation code all through. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh. You're all going to rush home tonight and start <laughs> spinning, spinning banners. There's, there's one one sort of word of warning, I think, with Edge Animate. With great power comes great responsibility. Can you animate every CSS property of every element on the page? Yes. Should you? No. So there are parts of pages where you can do some cool stuff. You can do some seriously nice stuff on pages. Make it nice, engaging, animate. Stick to that. Don't start spinning big banner images on is sort of a little bit crazy. Okay, let me jump back. That's only all I've done on here so far. I'm going to close that one down. Click going to save. We've just added some new features with, uh, if I create a new, we've also added the ability now to actually animate around motion paths. So in fact, I'm going to sort of open up a uh, create from template. I've built a template here that's quick open. So I've got a file here just where I've got some images. Um, a small screen. If I just run this currently at the moment, I just sort of did two parts of the image and just sort of animated them across a little bit. Not because you would put this on a web page, but because I wanted to show a particular feature. How come that one played really quickly? It's a bit weird, isn't it? But anyway, um, I've got a little um, a little symbol here in the library which I thought I just dragged up, but maybe I didn't. Right? Let's try that once more. Birds right, and I'll just drop it there. So this um, this little symbol that I've just sort of dropped off to the side here, if I double click on it, you'll notice that it's a symbol within the stage. If you think of it this way, it's just another div 
with something happening inside that div. And inside that div is this little animation. You see the bird flapping its wings. It's just that little animation happening there. Um, so if I go back to the main stage, what we're able to do now, we've added, it's not just, we only used to have the XY motion. We've now got motion path. So I can choose a motion path. I can use uh, my little toggle frame here. Let's just drag that along for two seconds. Let's just drag him across. Oops, I've dropped him a bit there. Let's just drag him up a little bit and just move him up a little bit. And you'll notice that I've got this line now. And on the line, I can just add points. The Bezier handles. I can scroll don't do that all. I can choose these Bezier points and choose the Bezier handles and start to adjust the path as I go along the line. Let's maybe add another line path here, drag that up, move it around. And when I run the bird, he sort of went. Now it looks a little bit silly because the trouble with the bird at the moment. The trouble with the bird at the moment is he's not following the line. So what I need to do is select, I also don't know where I've added this. Oh, I've only added it and made it really short. Let's just stretch that right out a little bit, a little bit longer. Um, if I grab this, I also need to have it auto-orient to the line. So it'll actually follow the curve of the line across. One tip when doing this, so I'm going to turn that on. But one tip when doing it, you need to go back to the beginning of the animation and make sure that at the beginning of the animation your object is facing the direction of the initial line. Does that make sense? Because, say for example, let's just do this badly, if I were to rotate him around the wrong way there, he will orient to the line, but he will orient to the line the wrong angle. You need to make sure he starts off the right direction for the line. So if I drag him back to the beginning again, let's just um, fix that up a little bit. Make sure he's sort of following, see he's sort of following the line there. And then inside Animate, he stops flapping because that symbol runs out of frames. But if I play it, because we've got a loop in that using JavaScript, when I play it now inside a browser, my bird comes and does the nice little flapping all across the screen. And he does it on my iPad too. Um, cool. Why it's working quickly on some and not on others, I have no idea. Anyway, all good. Um, I think I'm starting to run out of time, and I just wanted, I wanted to show you one last thing that I sort of. Oh, there's also interaction in here as well. I haven't even shown you any of the interaction, but basically, um, if you want something in here to happen, like you want to create a button or do something like that. Um, or say, for example, on a frame, when it gets to this particular frame here, I want something to happen. All I need to do is just open up this little insert trigger button, open that up, and it opens up, oh my god, this code window. <gasps> it's just JavaScript. In fact, all of Edge Animate, there's nothing weird and wonderful in Edge Animate. The file that it creates, there's nothing weird. It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There's nothing strange about the file that it creates. You can create it inside Edge Animate, take it out, and you can edit it and do whatever you want to it afterwards. Like, totally, totally, totally cool. Um, so if you type in code, we've added some buttons here to make it easy for um, you know, people who aren't necessarily coders, JavaScript people, to you know, they can click a button and get some code. Um, but you can also add any JavaScript framework. jQuery is built in by default because uh, we use that to do a lot of the cross-browser support. Um, we've also, there's a framework in there for Edge Animate to do some of the animation stuff that you can talk to directly. Um, or you could just add your own JavaScript framework the same way you would do on any HTML page. You just link the framework, you know, script source, and then start typing whatever you want. But if you start typing jQuery straight in here, it'll just start working straight away. It's JavaScript, no, no big secret. Um, you can also add code to objects themselves. And obviously when I do that, say for example, I wanted to do it to the bug, to the bird, if you could click on it, that'd be fun. Um, that might be fun thing. Um, click on this, it says, well, when do you want to trio that code? So on click on it, which is really funny because it's fine, chase the bird. Um, and then I can do whatever I want to do inside here. I can talk to anything else. It's JavaScript. I mean, 
series of uh, things into a slide in JavaScript. Um, what can you do? I mean, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. Also, you can create symbols and reuse them and make them dynamic and change them every time they're used. I've got an example in here. Um, if I open up here, this is just the Twitter screen I made. I made this in Edge Animate. Oh, there's no web connection. Uh, okay, it's awesome. Um, it bounces open all the Twitter feeds, it just runs down, but it duplicates. It has this little animated thing that brings out the image, the text, who's it from, it's to, bounces it out for each of the people, for all the tweets that are there. Um, I can't believe I'm trying to explain this, but do it on a whiteboard. Um, but the cool thing is, it's just one cell. I just built one animated symbol. But I can just say in JavaScript and jQuery inside Animate, I just say for every tw tweet, just throw up another one and put it underneath the last one. And it's doing it just like you would in any JavaScript thing, but it's got all the animations in there. And the reason I wanted to show you this one in here was I put a filter, one of the custom filters that I showed you right at the very beginning. Because I had, as they're up there for like 20 seconds, and then they all go and burn up with a custom filter, and it was going to be awesome, but you don't get to see that. I'm going to show you one, one, one last thing. Can I show you this? Oh, here, I think I can. I think I can, I think I can. I wanted to build something to show off the Edge tools and services. And a couple of years ago, I used to be like push Flash. I used to be the Flash guy. I used to do all sorts of stuff um, with Flash. And I built a game in Flash called Mini Dodgem Air Hockey. It was awesome. It's like a top-down board game with two cars, mini cars, drive around. And I wanted to know, could I rebuild it in HTML? Just using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. No anything else, no plugins. So obviously you realize that I can. So I've got in here mini dodge air hockey. It's all just um, HTML, one HTML page. Um, it's got a little bit of, oh, I'll zoom out a little bit. It's got a little bit of CSS, it's got a little bit of audio, a um, little bit of JavaScript, some images, not many images, that's all. Um, and the JavaScript, and I've used jQuery and a couple of other sockets and stats and stuff and one file. So I'm going to run this quickly in a browser. Oh, come on, really? Why? I'm, I'm the, I might just try quitting Chrome and try again. This is something seriously weird with my Chrome. Okay, I have no idea something is wrong. Let's click out of that. Come on, please. Maybe I have to disable the network completely. Huh? Maybe I have to disable the network completely. It's not disabled, no, because I need to have I need okay. to have this talking to my phone and my tablet at the moment. Oh come on. Why, is, why would something be that weird on my suddenly tonight? Can you try it with Firefox maybe? Huh? Can you try it on Firefox maybe? On Firefox, I could I could do it on Firefox. Hey, I'm I'm browser agnostic. I'm happy to use anything. Why? Why? I don't understand why it's going so yeah. Oh, I, sorry, I don't know why it's so slow. But this is mini Dodger Man Hockey. Um, am I going to try and run this? I'll try and do it. I'll run it like this first. So you run the game, and it's using. Um, yeah, I'm not connected to the net, so you're not getting the web fonts. I had a really nice, cool digital web font for the thing. But, um, but basically, it uses the arrow keys to drive the green car, the WASD keys to drive the red car, and the game, basically, you just play like going like this. Um, let's if I'm not very good at it. I'm really not good at it. Oh, stop. 
score. Yes. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is—I don't know why. So you can see up here it's running at 57, 58 frames a second. It's using a physics engine, Box 2D. I don't know if you know, Box 2D is just a JavaScript. Um, well, it's been ported to JavaScript. You know, it's—it's it's a physics engine. It basically says this is gravity, this is bounce. You know, and all I'm doing is just using it to track. <laughs> Did I something happen? Um, in fact, if I turn, if I just hit the B key. You'll see there's the physics engine running in the background saying, and I built the physics game to an exact size, um, 1060 by 600 or whatever. Um, and then I'm scaling everything. So the game itself is actually totally responsive. So I've made sure that it will run on any size browser nicely. Everything responds as the game plays, just using normal responsive design. But it's always in the background. The game is always that it's just scaling everything according to the browser size. Does that make sense? So the game just runs at the same size in the background. Um, and then I'm just scaling everything across it. Now, the cool thing is I can't show you because I'm not on the internet in here, but um, this runs happily on my iPad. It's HTML5, CSS3, there's nothing bizarre on it. But the trouble is as soon as you run it on your iPad or a tablet, an Android tablet, it doesn't matter. Blackberry, go crazy, whatever, whatever you want. It's HTML. The trouble is, you run it on here, and I'm still back in my Animate file. You can't control it using the keyboard. So, what do you do? So, what I decided to do was build another file. So, I'm just going to refresh this one, start this one again. Hopefully, it won't take too long. Maybe it will. Okay, while it's doing that, I built another website, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and I used one of our other web uh, edge tools and services called PhoneGap Build. I don't know if you know PhoneGap or PhoneGap Build. Basically, taking web content and you um, it converts it to an application that runs on your iPhone, your Android phone, your BlackBerry, WebOS. Um, Symbian, Windows Phone 7, Vata, you name it. It just runs applications across all of those. Good, I'm up again. Okay, I'm going to do something and if this works, I'll be absolutely amazed. What I've done is I've made a little application for a controller on my phone. Why did I make an application, not just a website? Because I wanted to access the accelerometer. And on a phone, yet in a browser, you can't yet access the accelerometer in a browser. But you can through an application. So I built the application in HTML, use find that build to build it. So let's see if this works. I'm going to get a little server talking to each other, and this is where I'm starting to be a bit nervous. Um, what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to open up terminal. Uh, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to run a node server. The node server is just running socket IO talking to each other. So let's just run uh, no. So this control.js, I just wrote a little server so that they just talk, talk back and forth to each other. Okay, it's running. So the server's, server's on and running. I then need to get them talking to each other. So if I come in here, I need to know the address of the server, which is 10.4. One, oh sorry, 10.0.1.4. Let's copy that. Let's paste that in here. Should it have the dot at the end? No. Okay, submit. Okay. So hopefully now, if I just check on terminal. Oh, yeah. So that's um, that. Sign it on, so that's all good. So now I'm going to come back to my phone, and on here I'm going to run a little application called the Mini Dodger Air Hockey Controller. Seriously, with names like these, it's got to succeed. Um, I have to type in the same address on here. Let's just get rid of this. Type in and. Zero dot one dot 
4, submit, click OK. Oh yeah, saw the handshake. Now, on here, I have to choose my car, and you'll notice I'll start the game. So you'll notice down the bottom I've got two connection lights here, and they're just divs. They're just divs with a gradient, with a grey gradient, radial gradient. Um, I'm going to change them to a green radial gradient when the connection happens. So I'm going to pick a car. All I do is pick the pick one of the cars, the green car. Hopefully, cross your fingers, the green light comes on. Uh, please. It's my big finale. The green light's not going to come on. But anyway, you get the accelerometer. This is HTML as well. It's built responsibly as well. And all you do is hit the accelerator. And yes. Yeah, it's. Oh! Oh, I don't know why the green lights don't come on, but yeah, there you go. I'm controlling the car. Um, why car the car goes backwards when you turn the brakes on? I don't know, but um, I couldn't think of another way. <laughs> Mini dodge and air hockey, and the control <laughs> the controller the controller. This could be run on an Android phone, an iPhone, a, you know. Like the Windows phone, it doesn't matter. It's, um, it's using phone to build it. Um, and that can run on a tablet, it can run on a phone, anywhere you run HTML, um, it can run as well. Um, so that was, that was a little bit of fun. I did do, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I did do another version of this um, at one stage called Caribbean Catamaran Air Hockey. And the reason I did this one, I wanted to add a couple of bits to it, so I'll run it in Chrome Canary. I really apologise for my machine tonight. I don't know about it. It's seriously bizarre. But I did, yeah, I did a boat one, and the boat one has um, its own little controller. The Caribbean Catamaran Air Hockey Controller. And once that runs, it's, yeah. um, I'm not going to control it through this because you've seen that happen already before. With that. See, I've also added another layer so you can go underneath the plants and get the shadow underneath the, like the palm trees. And the ball. But the reason I did this one, um, I'll see like that. You pick your boat and then it's got like a ship steering wheel and a accelerator. So apparently on a boat as well, you use an accelerator and a brake to drive the boat for some reason. I don't know why. But, um, but have a look at the water. It's using one of the custom filters. So I've just literally got a blue layer and I've added a custom filter and animated it over time so that the water's just doing this nice little sort of ripple effect just using the CSS custom filter. I think that takes us full circle right back to the beginning of tonight. And that's, that's all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So I don't know if you guys have any questions for Paul. Uh, I would have one tiny question because you have email for 2D. Uh, what about 3D and the ability, for example, to have animation with age animate for, uh, for 3D, for example? Yeah. Okay, so currently no, no um, 3D animation at all inside Edge Animate. And in fact, Edge Animate at the moment is not using Canvas. It's all exactly. um, it's all HTML. It's not Canvas animation. Exactly. Um, so it's CSS. You are just using CSS for now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Still. So uh, as far as 3D animation, Canvas animation, we don't have anything. Okay. Are you planning to in integrate uh, any Canvas you know, animation base or SVG animation base? Good uh, question. Okay. Okay. Still. 
Thank you. Cool. I think there's. I think down the track, um, I think there's a big call for you know, obviously you know, three D yeah. um, canvas. The trouble is now it's still browser support still limited. Um, oh, by the way, there's toys there. Don't go without yeah, browser go support. Without toys. Um, <laughs> there's still limited browser support um, yeah. or consistent browser support. We've been really careful in Edge Animate to make sure that um, what you do inside Edge Animate will work in most modern browsers. Um, we do, that said, we do inside Edge Animate, I don't know if I've still got it open or I put it. No, it's still in here. I haven't done anything here. Let me grab a rectangle and draw something and put a radial gradient in it and do that. Oh no, still not doing it. Um, sometimes down here in the control bar we put an exclamation mark and if that pops up, you click on it and it says, sorry, that feature won't work in IE7. Um, that feature won't work in this. So we, we tried to make sure that what you can do in Edge Animate is consistent across browsers, but we'll give you a warning if it doesn't. And there's fallbacks built into Edge Animate as well. You can decide what a sort of a graceful um, fallback you can have inside there if it's not supported. But yeah, down the track, I mean, yeah. Okay. But I, I think you've got to wait. We've got to wait for better browser support first. Um, yeah, but I think we have already enough to play with already with, as it is with the CSS anyway. So okay. 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 But thank you. Thank you, indeed. Right. Thank you. Thanks, guys.